education happens in different ways, learning happens in different ways. Um, we always hear stories about amazing things that are happening in schools, and we hardly ever hear about things that happen outside of school. Hi, I'm Kevin Curry Knight, and welcome to Learning by Living, the podcast about people who learn outside of conventional schools. In this premiere episode, my co-host Gina Riley and I sit down and we talk about what this podcast is going to be. Long story short, we're both professors, and while we are in colleges of education, we have a keen interest in people who learn outside of conventional school settings, whether that means they're unschooled, homeschooled, educated in a very non-traditional environment, etc. So in this first episode, Gina and I are going to sit down, talk about what we want this podcast to be, preview the first few episodes that we've already recorded, and tell a little bit of our own stories about why we became interested in people who learn outside of conventional schools. So I hope you enjoy this first episode and keep listening. Hey, Gina. Hey, Kevin. So word on the street is that we have a podcast coming out. We do. It's something I'm super excited about. Yeah, it's it's been in the works for a while. I feel like we've been thinking about like what kind of podcast we should do, and it kind of decided on a podcast where we talk to unschoolers and world schoolers and folks who learn outside of conventional schools and kind of just get their stories. Like, what is it like? What are the, what are the challenges? What are the the benefits? How do you learn stuff? Things like that. It should be really fun. I'm so looking forward to listening to other people's stories. I know we both have our own story about how we got involved in the movement. Um, but one of the things I love is really listening and hearing other people's experiences, um, the joys and challenges, all of it. I can't wait. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I know, like I said, you and I have been kind of thinking about we're both involved in the self-directed education space and, and learning outside of conventional schooling and stuff like that. And then um, I was at a uh, kind of a conference, a, a meetup of some alternative schools and heard just so many stories like I always do. People are like dying to tell their stories about like how you learn stuff outside of school. And I was telling them like, well, maybe I should, we should do a podcast about that. And they're like, you know, that would be awesome because when I was a kid and I was learning outside of school, um, it would have been really cool to hear other people's experiences because you always kind of feel like you're the only one and you're doing this thing that nobody else in your neighborhood is doing. And Stuff like that. Yeah, gosh, it's so exciting. I think, I mean, it's my hope that this podcast um, does to others what stuff like growing up without schooling did um, for me when I was a young unschooling mom in the 90s. Um, the The fact that other people are doing the same thing as you is really powerful. The experiences of someone who is are doing something different is really powerful. So I'm so excited to talk to people and hear their stories. Yeah. So why don't we talk for a little bit on uh, introing people, the podcast, kind of explaining to people what we want the podcast to be and kind of what our ideas are for this. So, So why does the world need another education podcast? How about we start there? Gosh, that's such a good question. You know, I think it's all about the fact that education happens in different ways. Learning happens in different ways. Um, we always hear stories about amazing things that are happening in schools. And we hardly ever hear about things that happen outside of school, how people learn by living, how people learn at home, how people learn in self-directed learning centers, their experience learning within a Sudbury school or a free school or another type of democratic school. So I think it's going to be really, really powerful to hear stories about how people truly do learn by just living, by just living their average day, um, and how that learning translates. Yeah, I, I think for me, too, it's when you tell people about experiences and people learn outside of school and parents maybe are thinking about, should I do this for my kid? One of the things that I think always comes up is, well, how are they going to learn X or how are they going to learn Y? Because we're so used to thinking about learning as something you do in school that it's really hard to think about what is this, what can this look like outside of school? Like how would someone learn like history or how would someone come to learn a foreign language or something like that outside of school? And, you know, I've heard a lot of stories of people who've done it. You've heard a lot of stories about people who've done it. And I feel like it's now kind of, maybe we should start kind of telling these stories and letting the people who have lived these stories tell these stories so that maybe folks who are thinking about or, for, or folks who are curious can kind of get a perspective on, well, what does it look like when you don't have school in the equation? 
Yeah. You know, when you learn in these alternative learning ways, it's such a brave and courageous choice. Um, I know as a young unschooling mom, I had so many fears um, in jumping in. And so I hope this podcast really does something to really temper those fears um, to really be a turning point for people who might be considering but might be scared. Um, And to really, you know, obviously advocate for the brave and courageous choice of learning without schooling or traditional schooling. Yep. Maybe we should preview um, a few of the guests that we're going to have upcoming. So I know the first guest that we're going to have upcoming, which I'm really excited about, is your son, Ben. So let's just preview that a little bit. Like, So we're going to have Ben on. So just briefly, kind of what what can we expect to learn from a story like that? Yeah, I think Ben um, and I had a really interesting conversation. You know, it's one thing to be in the midst of unschooling, and it's another thing to be far from that place. Ben's in graduate school. He's a music educator. um, He's done some substitute teaching. He's done a lot of things. um, And so it was a really interesting look back at our experiences, um, both parent and child, um, and his experiences as a young person, maybe learning to read his experiences as a person in high school and middle school, um, or what we would consider high school and middle school, and as a person within a college environment who never, ever went to school. Um, So that interview is obviously going to be one of my favorites. I got to do it with my son, um, who's like the heart of my life. So that's going to be one of my favorites. But I also think we tackled some tough topics within there, um, especially about the challenges of having family who maybe weren't the most supportive the challenges of just being an unschooler who, you know, where no one else does this thing and you do. Yeah. And then um, I guess we should let viewers know that by the time they listen to this, we will have already recorded that episode. So that episode is actually, um, we've already done that interview and it's, it's really fascinating. It's really illuminating. Like you said, you get into a lot of the pros and we get into a lot of the, the challenges, especially of doing this crazy thing that not a lot of people around you would necessarily agree with. And then we're going to do an episode with a journalist and unschooling parent of four, Carrie McDonald. And she's going to kind of talk about her perspective as a, a parent, especially of four kids, none of which are in a conventional school. I'm, I'm looking forward to that one, too. It's so amazing. You know, we were having that conversation with her. She's so well-spoken and such an amazing advocate for the movement. Um, But we also have to remember that she's also a mom. She's doing this. She's in the trenches doing it. Um, I loved hearing stories about how her kids learned to read, how her um, oldest learned Korean. I love hearing those stories. Um, She is such a great interview and, again, such an amazing guest to have on the show. Yeah. So I wonder if at this point, Um, because we haven't really introduced ourselves yet. So people might be wondering, like, why are we doing a podcast? Who are we? Um, Of course, they know a little bit about you by now because they know that you have a son who was uh, unschooled, didn't go to a conventional school. But why don't we talk a little bit about ourselves and just kind of briefly intro who we are. I know both of us are academics. So we come to it not only from personal experience, but, but academics. So would you mind kind of like briefly introing kind of who you are and then maybe what brought you to to the idea of unschooling and self-directed education? Sure. Um, So currently, I am the program coordinator and a clinical professor of adolescent special education at CUNY Hunter College in Manhattan. Um, I love my job so much. I get the opportunity to teach teachers, um, which is such an interesting job um, given my background, but I really do honor our teachers who are teaching within traditional schools um, and And so I do automatically, and I think it's important for those who listen to our podcast to know that I'm always going to be super supportive of teachers and those who go into the field of teaching, as well as super supportive of those who choose um, to not send their kids to school. Um, I always have my foot in both worlds, and I'm glad I do. It gives me sort of this balanced perspective. Um, In my research life, I hold a totally different title. I research intrinsic motivation, self-directed learning, um, unschooling, unschoolers young adult unschoolers, um, all of that. So again, one foot in the traditional education world and the other foot in the research world in terms of um, really researching and getting to know individuals who have lived without conventional school um, and who are unschooling and homeschooling. 
Yes. So without giving away too much of the episode with your son and you, um, yeah, what was it that led you to this? Was it an academic interest first and then a personal thing or was it a personal thing first and then became an academic interest? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. Um, it's chicken egg, right? I think it was a personal thing first. Um, I think as a parent, you get to see all the amazing things um, that your kids learn and do by themselves as they grow up. Um, I was a young single mom. Um, I was very influenced by individuals within the attachment parenting world and within the world of La Leche League. And I think through that world, probably I got um, or became interested in unschooling um, and homeschooling. I think the primary reason was that in learning and growing with my son, I saw that at age four, um, you know, he was doing different things than kids his age. Like he was obsessed with gems and minerals and, you know, learning the periodic table. And he had already, you know, he knows his alphabet. He knows his numbers. And I sat there and I, I thought, my gosh, am I, am I doing any favors? Um, in just, you know, doing what everyone else does and putting this kid on a school bus and put, enrolling him in school. And at the time, the strong answer for myself was, no, I'm, I'm not doing any favors um, to this beautiful, quirky child. Um, you know, in fact, I might be doing, you know, some not so great things by sending him to school. Um, so we didn't. We The school bus did not come to our house when Ben was five. And that to many people was a very, very surprising thing. Um, I think part of my story is that we got a lot of backlash. I got backlash from my parents who strongly believe in education, from my mother who was a guidance counselor, from my sister who was uh, at that time um, studying to be a physician. You know, this is not a thing that people did and it was certainly not a thing that a very young single working and going to school mother did. Um, and I think at that point, the choice seemed pretty irresponsible. Um, but again, I was totally devoted to my son and what worked best for him. And at the time, it wasn't going to be school. Um, at the same time, this is probably 1999 or so, my son was four, um, I was doing my master's thesis. And my master's thesis was focused on intrinsic motivation and self-determination and who to better study intrinsic motivation and self-determination um, than homeschoolers and people who um, really spent their time learning through life. And so I wrote my master's thesis, an ethnographic study of homeschoolers um, and intrinsic motivation. And that thesis really just sort of turned my life around. Um, within the thesis, I... Uh, the theoretical perspective within the thesis was Edward Deasy and Richard Ryan's self-determination theory and cognitive evaluation theory. And it was a theory I began to really fall in love with. It was a theory I wanted to live my life by. Um, and I got to see that theory in my my child growing up. You know, I got to see the benefits of intrinsic motivation there. Let's um, talk about that theory a little bit first, because I don't know if a lot of folks are going to be familiar with it. So uh, DC and Ryan... Um, have this very popular in the education world theory of how motivation works. So can you explain briefly kind of what that is and how it kind of connected to the homeschoolers that you were seeing, including your son? Self-determination theory is basically um, a theory about defining what intrinsic motivation is. And basically that's being motivated by what you love and your passions and not being motivated by things that are more extrinsic, such as money or grades or gold stars. Um, and that theory really spoke to me. I was never a person to be motivated by extrinsic things. Um, I always had to love what I was doing or I wasn't interested. I always had to like be attached and passionate about what I did. Otherwise, I wasn't interested. Um, and so that theory really spoke to me. Cognitive evaluation theory is a sub-theory of self-determination theory and talks about 
three basic environmental tenets um, that really can facilitate feelings of intrinsic motivation in others. We have to remember that we can't force intrinsic motivation in anyone. Um, we can only facilitate it. So I talk a lot about DT and Ryan's cognitive evaluation theory in my work um, and those three environmental tenets, which I'm sure we'll get to within the podcast, are the tenets of competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Yeah, just to preview it for my own story, um, which I'll get to a bit later, I guess. Um, DG and Ryan's theory was one of the things that actually kind of shifted my focus from conventional schools to, well, wait a minute, there, it seems like if this theory is true, um, there's a lot of things in conventional schooling that don't quite jibe with this. Yeah. Yeah, it's a theory I, I teach my teachers, um, but it's a theory that's hard for my teachers as well because it is hard to facilitate competence and especially autonomy uh, within an environment that doesn't always value those things. Um, and so, you know, there's an interesting dichotomy there. Yeah, cool. I guess my story is a little bit different than yours in terms of how I came to self-directed education and kind of valuing this idea. So I didn't come to it more through personal reasons first. I came to it more through academic reasons first. So I have been a professor in a college of education um, for, I guess, what, this is my sixth year now. And then before that, I was a PhD candidate uh, in education. And before that, I was a teacher. And before that, I was an instructional assistant. So I know the education space pretty well, um, but I've always been pretty kind of conventionally minded just because I was never aware that there was any other option. Even when I was in school myself, especially K-12, um, just never really liked it. I think I was always resigned to it, although my parents like to remind me that I actually really did hate it. Um, they gave up on trying to get me to do homework in middle school because it just it, it just didn't, it didn't work. They weren't going to fight that battle every night. And... Um, you know, I went to college. I, I They convinced me that I was going to drop out my junior year because I skipped so much school. But they kind of convinced me to stay mostly because they said they wouldn't financially support me if I, if I dropped out. And I did want to go to one particular college. So I was really into music. And I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts and for, for drum set. And I studied songwriting. So I have a bachelor's in songwriting. And you know, as you can imagine, it's not a terribly academic place. Uh, academics are kind of like you have to do them because it's accredited. Uh, but everything you learn is pretty much learned outside of, of school. So I got done, and at some point I became a substitute teacher, um, which led to me getting a master's in special education, which led to me becoming a teacher. And then that led to me doing a PhD in education a few years after that. And through all of that time, I was very conventional um, you know, even when I was a teacher, I, I liked to get students involved. I liked getting, doing activity stuff, so it wasn't all lecture. But at the same time, it was, um, you know, it didn't really occur to me that there's another way to do it. And you see all the things that teachers generally see. You see a lot of disengaged students. You see a lot of folks doing things that they question the value of. You know, the question is always, why do I have to learn this? Um, or the question is, will this be on the test? So, you know, those two questions being the most standard questions. So, you know, kind of intuitively that there's probably not as much learning going on as you'd like. But I didn't really think that there was any other kind of way to do it. So, Anyway, fast forward a few years, and I'm in a college of education. I'm a professor. And ironically, I stumbled across self-directed learning because I was preparing for a course that I was teaching on, you know, what is the best research about how learning takes place and how learning happens? What is the best research on motivation? Stuff like that. So I'm teaching this course. So I'm reading a whole bunch of articles and books and stuff like that. And I start coming across some research that doesn't really make sense with the conventional schooling experience. And one of which was Dietschy and Ryan's work. And I'm thinking about it, and I see a lot of articles on how increasing student choice and autonomy and freedom leads to good learning outcomes. And I kept looking at those studies, and I never ran across a study that said, and this much freedom is too much. Like, this is where it stops working. Um, another set of articles I started thinking about were a set of articles about interest and the role of interest in learning. So they do a lot of studies about, you know, kids who learn things that they report being interested in versus kids who learn things that they don't report being interested in. So what, what are the differences in learning outcomes? And there's some debate about what the effect is or how much the effect there is, but the effect is always positive. It's always the more interested you are in what you're learning, the better you'll learn it, the more you'll retain it, the longer you retain it, the deeper you'll, you'll learn, the more you'll persevere through challenges in your learning and stuff like that. Um, and then I also came across evidence 
studies that reinforced all this about video games in education. So there's a lot of research on video games as learning devices, because if you think about it, a video game really is nothing but a big learning tool where you just, in order to beat the game, you have to learn and learn and learn and learn. So I started thinking about all of this data and it all reinforced each other. Because when you think about video games and what is it about video games that are so motivating, it's things like, well, it's voluntary, first of all. No one makes you play a video game. Things like there's no time frames on when you have to beat a level. I mean, there may be a time limit in the game. That some games have a time limit per level. But it's not like you have to beat the level by this Friday, otherwise we're moving on to the next level. You have as much time as you want. You can fail over and over and over again. And there's no like penalty to it and stuff like that. So I'm reading this research and I'm talking to my students and we're saying, well, okay, here's what the research says. Now, how do we apply this in schools? And it really just started to dawn on me that if this research is correct, and it seems to be because there's really not much by way of contradictory research, then the way we do things in conventional school is, is maybe counterproductive in certain ways. And so I started researching self-directed learning. So what does learning look like when it's outside of school? Um, and I really started thinking about, okay, if do most learning experiences that we have, do they look more like school or video games? And I started making a list of like all the activities I, I can think of people learning. Things like you learn new software in the office, or you learn to garden, or you learn guitar, or um, you have to learn how to cook a, a recipe or whatever. I just started making a list. And I thought, like, does that look more like school or does that look more like video games? And, and most of the stuff I came across, it looks more like video games than it does like school. So I, I just started to think, well, we have a problem. And then I just started kind of going down the research rabbit hole and I ran across unschooling and I ran across Sudbury Valley and it's like, wow, there are these places where none of the conventions of school exist that we think are necessary, yet these kids learn. So that's amazing. So that's that's kind of my story on, on how I came across it. Yeah, I think it's going to be super exciting. You know, I don't want this. I think both of us don't want this to be the unschooling podcast. Um, we want it to be the, you know, let's talk to people who learn outside the traditional realm of school podcast. Yeah. Um, so, you know, along with unschooling, we'll talk about uh, different self-directed learning centers and we'll talk about Sudbury schooling and homeschooling and uh, world schooling and all the different types of schooling that maybe uh, are not in a building <laughs> and and do not take place in a classroom. Yeah, I think it's important to stress. I mean, another thing I don't want this podcast to be, and I think you'd agree, is the unschooling is just the way to go uh, podcast, right? And so I, I want this to be like, here's a glimpse of some alternatives. Here's a glimpse of how people learn when they don't have grades and when they don't have tests. But that doesn't mean that everyone should just abandon grades and tests. It, it just means that here's this other option, especially if you aren't familiar with it. Like listening to the voices of people who have learned this way, who've learned reading without being taught, who've learned math without grades in a, a formal curriculum, things like that. Because I think to a lot of folks, it just, it, it's so foreign to the way you, you would normally think about it. Yeah, it's all about school choice. It's all about um, really being able to think about and choose, you know, where your own child might learn best or really be able to think about learning on a whole. Um, my hope is that it won't just be alternative schoolers that listen to this podcast. My hope is that we'll get an audience of individuals who are researchers, who are administrators, who are um, superintendents, teachers, and principals. You know, there is something to say about learning from people who do things differently. Um, and so my hope is that some of those stakeholders will come along for the ride and be open enough to hear the stories of those who may not learn in that, you know, in the setting that they're used to learning happening in. I think even if you're not in the questioning phase, right, it's just being able to listen and hear about alternative learning experiences. Um, some people aren't ready to jump in and question <laughs> or question, right? They're just sort of trying to collect data um, in their own heads, whether through hearing stories or listening to experiences and things like that. Um, so I think if you are listening to the podcast and you are in the data collection phase and really don't know where this is going, um, that's really awesome too. Um, I think both of us are very open to all types of learning experiences and are always going to, um, you know, just want to people to listen, um, to hear. Um, you don't even have to be learning, right? You just, um, you can just be absorbing. <laughs>
Sure, sure. Yeah, cool. Well, I, I can't wait to get started on this. So hopefully this uh, introduction whets people's appetites a little bit. Um, hopefully by the time they hear this, we'll have some quite a few episodes up that you can listen to with a oh, whole bunch of diverse stories. I'm super excited. The list of guests and people um, we're going to have on is really amazing. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, uh, with that said, hopefully uh, folks start listening to some other episodes. Good to talk to you, Gina. Good to talk to you too, Gina.